Hello everyone and welcome to Saxworks. It's so wonderful to be able to have you here to listen to the genius and the inspo of this wonderful person. <laughs> Christina Wallace is not only a founder, former founder of Quincy Apparel, um, RIP, still love that dress, uh, <laughs> uh, a concert, a, 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 what is it, what did you say, chorus? A chorus. A chorister. A chorister. She is a pianist, a cellist, a mountain climber, a marathoner, a triathlete, right? I mean, there, there are lots of things this woman does and can do, and she does almost all of it well, and some of it she does absolutely terribly, <laughs> and that is the topic of our talk today. I think it hurt even a little bit just to hear me say that, right? <laughs> uh, Christina's day job is a professor of entrepreneurship at Harvard, where she is molding the young business leaders of tomorrow. Please, help us. Um, and uh, today she's gonna be talking to us about why you need to get really good at failure in order to be really good at being really good at everything else, which is kind of her thing. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'd like to present Christina Wallace. A welcome to Saxworks. We are so Thank happy you. to have you here in our beautiful space today. I am delighted to be here and I'm eyeing the French fries, <laughs> which I hope you will all take part in, but save at least a few for me. Um, I am super excited. So, so Rachel first uh, suggested that, that we do this talk and, and wanted to kind of find the, I guess, inspiration, the wellness behind why I do such crazy things like run marathons and climb mountains. Um, and I said, the truth of it is because I needed to be bad at something. Um, I am an overachiever in every other part of my life, um, so I am also an overachiever at failure. And, um, and I, for a very long time, like many millennials who were uh, socialized and raised that we could be anything, um, were also kind of messaged, well, that means you have to be something. <laughs> something very impressive and interesting, uh, otherwise it's your fault. Um, and, and we had uh, you know, the helicopter parents who kind of hung out to make it uh, the, the other sort of message of like, if anything goes wrong, that's gonna be the end of everything. Like, like we must prevent even micro failures in, in all these parts of your life. Um, and even if you lose at the soccer game, we'll give you a participation. And um, in many ways, millennials were, were originally criticized, now Gen Z gets this banner, of being kind of um, these special snowflakes that needed these participation trophies. I would like to point out it was our parents who insisted on them. They gave them out as well. Uh, the parents needed them more than we did. But, but it, it taught us that failure was literally the worst thing that could happen. And then we graduated into the Great Recession, and even those of us who succeeded in school struggled to get jobs, struggled to find a way to actually live <laughs> and pay for things like student loans and rent. Um, and it, it just doubled down on this idea that failure was literally the worst thing that, that you could do. And so and better to shame, be safe. Right? The shame, like shame associated with it. Absolutely. Better to be safe, better to pick one thing, go all in on it, and like build your career, uh, do your thing. And the problem with that is that, um, at least in my lifetime, we've had... Uh, well, 9-11 was when I was in college, the Great Recession was when I graduated, and then COVID happened in the midst of what are supposed to be my prime earning years. So these once in a generation, <laughs> once in a hundred year disruptions are coming every five to seven years. So, so this notion of, of you know, pick one thing, build on it, be really good at it, um, is actually a really risky decision. I would argue, and I do argue in, in the book that I'm working on right now, The Portfolio Life, that it's the riskiest career choice you could make to pick one thing and go all in on it. That's the um, thesis of the portfolio That's the, the thesis life. of the portfolio life. That, that if you uh, follow the advice that your parents and your grandparents gave you, um, you are more likely to end up uh, fresh out of luck at some point, not even because of anything you did, right? That, that failure can be that you suck at something, but it could also be you got laid off because of a merger that you have no control over, because of a bad choice that the CEO made, because of some macroeconomic force outside of your control. Or because um, of a pandemic. Or because of a pandemic. And so, so understanding that material disruptions are the new normal, and that um, there are lots of factors outside of your control that can influence your own success, um, means that building a portfolio for your life, for your career, just like you build a financial portfolio to offset 
risks to diversify is, is how you have to approach this. Now, portfolio theory uh, works, the math of it, um, is about the relationship between risk and reward. She's also really good at math. She loves math. <laughs> I do, I love math. You should see her on Pi Day, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> My baby's new do around Pi Day, and I really hope it shows up on Pi Day, <laughs> if I have any control over it anymore. And I'm um, sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so the, the math of, of risk and reward, right, so it says, in general, low risk, low reward, really stable investments like cash or certificates of deposit, low risk, low reward. Um, high risk, high reward. So things that are very unlikely to happen, but if they do, they could make you a gazillionaire. Um, and that can be anything from angel investing to speculative uh, things, Bitcoin if you're into it, I guess. Um, and that has generally been the relationship between risk and reward. And historically, the idea of one stable, steady job is a low risk, but low reward outcome. Predictable income, up and to the right, two to three percent every year until you retire with a gold watch. The problem is because of these economic changes and, and the disruption that's happening, that has become a medium or high risk, low reward. And like the gold watch outcome, you know, doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> like if you yeah. get it, it's going to be fake gold, and they're not going to even give it to you. Um, so you're more likely to be laid off six months before. <laughs> so, so the idea then is how can we build in diversification into our portfolio, and how do we offset that risk to provide potential returns in our lives? To do that, you have to go after things that might fail. Literally by going after things that are not guaranteed to pan out, higher risk, you're introducing the concept that failure is part of the portfolio. And that's fine because not everything has to pan out. You have multiple irons in the fire, some of them will work, some of them will, you don't know which ones they will be, but in the end, the portfolio pays off. To do that, you have to be okay with failure. So can I, so for this portfolio life, yes. right? So can you give me just an example of having a, like a broad portfolio of things that are compensable? Sure. So for example, um, I uh, currently, as a professor, uh, my day job, I teach, um, I'm working on a book, I do public speaking, I do some consulting, I occasionally do some uh, some coaching, independent one-on-one -on -one coaching with people. Uh, when I do my taxes at the end of the year, I have between seven and 10, 1099s, in addition to my W-4. So that is multiple income streams, multiple types of work um, that I sort of balance and, and um, mix together over the course of the year. This is nothing like what my portfolio looked like a few years ago. Um, before I took the job as a professor, I worked at a tech company where I was a vice president. Um, while doing that, I had a podcast and uh, was still uh, probably speaking. Probably say the name of the podcast, it's relevant here. The Limit Does Not Exist, also a math joke, also a mean girls joke. Um, and, uh, and in my free time was advising startups, uh, just for fun. For, I wasn't paid for this, it was part of my kind of community involvement, less so of an income stream. But I spent a lot of time with other young entrepreneurs, um, mostly so they could avoid the failure that my first company had. And um, that first company that failed, Quincy Apparel, um, my professor at business school uh, wrote a case study on that failure, mostly because I complained as a student that we never studied failures. So once I failed, I got to be the face of it. And, um, and spent six or seven years going back every year and teaching that case study. Again, for free. This was not a, a paid form of work, but it was part of my portfolio. I cared about sharing that experience with other entrepreneurs. So when I got to the end of my time at my last company and I knew I wanted to make a shift, I already had irons in the fire at HBS. I had a track record that I was great with students. I had a long portfolio of startups that I had advised and worked with for free, but proof that I was really good at coaching early stage entrepreneurs. And so it, it made a transition into becoming a professor, which I'm not an academic, I don't have a PhD, but it made that transition possible because I had evidence that this is work that I care about, that I'm good at. And what seemed like a really strange zigzag was actually really intuitive. And, and I think, you know, people think about the side hustle, 
the monetization of every skill they might have, and they probably like cringe a little. They're like, I'm exhausted. I don't want to have to monetize every you know, cake baking skill I have. And I get that. And this is not that. This is merely saying, what is the, the collection of things that you care about, that you're good at, that you've invested time developing skill in, and how do you balance and rebalance them as your needs change? Um, to incorporate a different mix. Some of them are income streams, some of them are things that you're just developing a skill set for. Um, at one point I was getting a master's degree in computer science on the side, that was in my portfolio. Halfway through that, it became very clear it wasn't serving me, it wasn't gonna be a thing that I really needed, and I, I laid that part of my portfolio off. How hard was that? How hard was that to, to walk like, away from that? you had already sunk the cost. I had, I paid cash for that. Um, it was hard. I don't quit things in general, but I realized, and this is one of the two kind of ways that, that you think about kind of recovering from failure. Um, very typically, there, there's the math argument and there's the psychology argument. <laughs> and you can choose which one you find more compelling. Um, on the psychology side, there's, there's resilience, which is sort of getting back on your feet and getting back to, it's bouncing back, right? Being, being able to pick up where you left off and keep going. And then there's adaptability, which is the pivot. It's I've learned new information coming out of this failure, and now I'm gonna make a different choice. And it's not inconsistent with what I thought I wanted to do something different now. And for me in the computer science degree, that was what I realized, that what I thought I wanted was inconsistent with what I wanted now, and it was a smart choice to be adaptable and change where I was going and invest my time and my money elsewhere. So wait, what was that decision you made with math or psychology when you, when you did that? A little bit of both. I certainly planned out how much more I would need to spend to finish the degree and I looked at what are the other things that I could be putting that money into. Bitcoin. You're bullish on Bitcoin. So. I should have. I bought I, it 500, I sold it 600. <laughs> Did you buy it at 500 uh, on the recommendation of anybody? I think it was you. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to tell me not to sell. And I, I didn't know because I already forgot about Bitcoin <laughs> for a couple of years until it became a thing. But no, I was able to analyze what else I could spend that money on, but I was also able to analyze what else I could spend my time on and where else I could put my work. Mm -hmm. But being able to do that required practice failing at other things. So let's talk about getting good at failure and how you figured out that you had to get good at failure. Like maybe your first reaction to failing wasn't so It wasn't so positive. Great. It wasn't. So Quincy failing was kind of the first time I'd ever really fallen flat on my face. Um, I, I did get a B minus in differential geometry in college. How dare you? And I tried to drop my math major as a result of it. And luckily my advisor would not sign the form. So I did in fact that degree. Um, but that was the closest I had had. Can we just talk a little point. bit about Quincy for people mm -hmm. to understand like what you put into it and like your hopes and dreams for it and mm. what, like why that yeah. was so particularly gutting. Not like a, not to be like, to, here, take your heart out. And, no, I do this once but, a year for yeah. Harvard Business School. It's, okay. it's fine. Right. Um, so Quincy was an amazing fashion brand for women. I still have all my Quincy clothes. I wear them. Uh, I should have worn mine to know where I can get them. Um, we didn't have a pregnancy line quite yet, so that's uh, they're on the shelf for a little bit. Quincy was uh, a brand for young, ambitious women, designed uh, at workwear mostly, professional wear, uh, designed around a woman's body. <laughs> so taking into account bra size, hip to waist ratios, height, uh, dimensions that affect how clothes fit, um, that men's suiting takes into account. I mean, obviously they don't have bra size, but they take into account chest measurements, arm lengths, neck measurements, waist and inseam, all of these things in off the rack sizes. And then women go and buy an eight, or worse, a medium. <laughs> You're like, what does that even mean? I'm six feet tall. A medium on me is not, right? This is ridiculous. So we, we created a different sizing algorithm. These were off the rack sizes. This is not custom, um, but it did require a different approach to inventory management and just manufacturing and operations management that my co-founder and I were not from the fashion world. We were approaching this 
uh, as customers who saw the gap in the market, who really wanted this for ourselves, but we were learning on the job, as many startup founders do, right? You see the gap because you're not insider. Um, and we raised a million dollars. We were up and running for almost two years, and we had a ton of, of love. Our customers loved us, the press loved us. There was a, a lot of momentum, but we just ran out of money while we were still learning. And, um, and once you're out of money, you gotta shut down. Like that's, that's the math of startups. And so um, we shut down and the same press that had been so generous in announcing our launch was really quite gleeful in documenting our failure. <laughs> and, and, and failure wasn't just my company has to shut down, it was my employees don't have a job anymore and their kids don't have health insurance anymore. Like this was a really visceral, public and very painful failure. And I went home after kind of all was said and done and I crawled into bed and for three weeks I just watched The West Wing, top to bottom, all seven seasons, just avoiding dealing with this. Um, and then I, I realized I needed to get a job because I was broke. Um, some startup founders have family money that they come from and have other resources to fall back on. I was not one of them. And so I paid my rent with a cash advance on my credit card and I took a shower and, uh, and then I emailed everyone I knew and said, I need you to get coffee and help me figure out what I should do next and how to land on my feet. Also, you have to pay for the coffee because I'm broke. Um, and uh, to their credit, 70 people said yes. And I did 70 coffee chats in 30 days to figure out what, what, where do I go? What am I good at? Because I don't even know anymore. And what do I do next? And, um, and I was able to land on my feet. I got a job in an early stage startup. I launched their New York office and sort of got back out into the world. Um, and what was interesting, I've, I've now come across this really great research on this, on like, why was I able to get through that? Um, in my case, it was very expedited, 30 days, because I was so broke. I actually see that as a huge, Plus, like if I had had the time to wallow for six or 12 months, I probably would have. Um, and I'm grateful I didn't. <laughs> it was, being broke has some advantages. Um, and so I was able to get back on my feet, but there, there are basically these kind of five steps to recovering from failure um, that help you not just be resilient, not just end up where you started, but to actually grow from that failure, to, to end up better than when you started. Um, the first one is uh, to acknowledge that what you thought was true, what you thought was going to happen, is no longer true, and that sucks, and does not mean you are fatally flawed as a person, <laughs> right? Like, like the, the difference between what you imagine and what is true, that juxtaposition hurts, but, um, but that is normal. Um, secondly, that uh, you can reduce anxiety by recognizing when your uh, kind of negative thoughts are just out of proportion for the situation at hand. I am, I am, I am medicated for my anxiety. Like I'm up there on the anxious meter. Um, I'm really good at anxiety, and uh, and it can be hard sometimes to not spiral, to not sort of walk through the like 17 things that are absolutely going to happen because failed here and instead kind of dial it back and say what is realistic for what is actually happening right now just like bring it down a notch um, third is and this I find really really helpful um, being open about your failure one of the things I think the startup world does a disservice to for failed founders is so many of them pretend there's no failure they get Apple hired or they have uh, uh, an acquisition for the pennies, um, and they get to spin it as a success, but they know it was a failure. And everyone else around them knows it's a failure too, but no one can say it out loud. And that, bottling that up, actually makes it really hard to move past it. And instead of just being open about it, like we were with Quincy, literally writing a case study and being the face of failure, helps you process it and move past it. Um, Third, fourth is uh, engaging in constructive storytelling about how that failure is helping you. And um, one of the things I realized in these 70 coffee chats, it was not about convincing those people 
that this failure was good for me. It was about convincing myself. It was about learning and putting it in the context of my narrative that this was not inconsistent with the identity that I had created for myself. Um, and, and being able to believe that story is, is like the crucial part. And then fifth, being really thoughtful about where do you go from here. So it's a forward facing action. It's not sitting and wallowing, but it's saying, okay, now, now what? Um, and what I real, realized coming out of, of the Quincy failure was that I was really bad at failing and I wanted to practice it. So I decided to take up running. Literally coming out of Quincy, I, I, it was 2013, I decided to run 13 half marathons in 2013. Because a half marathon is 13.1 miles, and so it makes for a great hashtag. Uh, I, I had not run 13 collective miles in my life to this point, but that was, that was um, a minor thing. And, um, and decided to do this because I was so bad at running. And I realized um, I'm bad at it, it's gonna be slow, um, so I'll have lots of time to think about it. I wanted to practice being bad at something and, and facing it over and over and over again and, um, and, and continuing to show up and running the next race anyway, knowing that I would be possibly the last person across the finish line. So can I ask you about the reinforcement you got from those around you? Because yeah. I, like, I remember, that, like, I, all I remember is us all being like, go Christina, go, this is amazing. <laughs> I mean, so is there some, is there like some dissonance between, hmm. you're like, no, but I really suck. No, you're supposed to acknowledge that I suck. Like what, like how, is there dissonance between like yeah. your goal mm. of failing mm -hmm. and saying, yes, I do fail and the world wanted to give you that participation trophy. Yeah, I mean, not only the world, like I got a medal at the finish line every single time, which is the most participation trophy you can get as an adult, right? Like you're paying for it. It's clearly, an but. achievement. <laughs> it was 13 achievements. It's true, but I, there was some cognitive dissonance. And I think at the beginning, there was a little bit of, of shame of like, but you don't know my finish time. And I never posted my finish time. I would only post the picture of me with my medal. Um, but over time, as I was talking to people, they're like, how are you doing this? You're so superwoman. I'm like, I'm literally not. I run a 12 minute mile. I just keep going one foot in front of the other until I hit the finish line. Like you could do this. You just have to not stop. That's literally the takeaway of how you run a marathon. You start and then you don't stop. And then eventually you hit the finish line. So I ran the New York City Marathon that year. My 13th marathon got canceled because of a government shutdown. Uh, and so in my 13th had to be the New York City Marathon. Of course. Um, go, go, how to go home. So it was a double, uh, you know, to finish it off. And I, I came in just a hit under six hours, which is literally like a 72 year old man passed me in the last mile in Central Park. And he was still running and I was not. I was definitely like speed walking at this point. And he's like, you got this. And I was like, thank you, high five. And he finished, and like five minutes later, I crossed the finish. I'm you sure know? there were people behind you. There were, for sure. But um, but like not too far behind me was the little sweeper uh, bus yeah. that like picks up the stride. You know, like it wasn't out of the question that I might not have finished in, in the time frame they lost. Um, I know a person who actually did not in the time frame they lost. Okay, well that at least I made it through that. I ran two more marathons after that, and I never got any faster. Um, but I did it anyway because it was a great reminder that I don't have to be amazing at something to try it anyway. Can we, um, like, so you were like, ran some marathons, what else can I fail at? Is there like a giant mountain <laughs> in the world that, you know, people might like to climb? Try that one. Yeah, so, so I decided to climb Kilimanjaro um, and then trek to Everest Base Camp. And um, I don't climb mountains uh, by, by training or by practice. I don't I'm like, know anyone who's climbed mountains. Uh, but it seemed like a fun thing to do, and I use fun in quotation marks. And um, and so I did Killy first, which is not really climbing; it's it's a hike. It's literally a hike. The but person who didn't finish the marathon also climbed the marathon. There you go. This is basic, this is one thing I learned at Harvard Business School, among others. Um, literally everyone who runs a marathon seems to also climb Killy. Like these are in the same vein. You can do one, you can do the other, which is just you keep going and don't stop, and you will make it to the finish. There's no like. <coughs> technical skills. There might be involved. a metaphor there. I, yeah. Might be. Um, so I, I climbed Kili. I was literally the last person in my group to make it to the summit. I was sobbing by the time I made it up there. It was hard. 
Yeah. It's just walking, but it's still hard. Um, it's cold. It's cold, right? It's freezing cold. You start the summit at midnight. You haven't slept. It's six straight hours of frozen scree, which is just like gravel, but it's slippery. And you get to the top, and you've been in altitude for two days. And I turns out I turned to a very mean person at high altitude. You don't know how you react to altitude until you get up there. I am very mean. And um, like mean to myself, but also to other people, but especially to myself. Um, I mean, and I really so, wish we had time to go down this route. But okay, for next time. And so I made it to the top, and I got my pictures. I ate my Snickers bar that I had kept in my armpit to you know keep it from freezing. And um, and then you have to go back down, which is also not enjoyable. But but it's not like a little bus. No, and somebody give you a little massage. No, you know, get to like all the way down. But what I, what I realized, um, even if you're the last person off the mountain, you still climb Kilimanjaro, right? And it was the same thing with Everest. Like Everest was 14 days uh, to base camp and back, and you're at altitude for more days than you are. Kili is like up and down. Everest is like up and across for a lot of days. Very mean at altitude. That was a psychological experiment. And, um, and I was the last one to base camp and I was crying the whole way and I felt terrible and I still made it. And it just, it reinforced for me that I don't have to be amazing to try, um, that I'm allowed to do things that I'm bad at and still do it anyway. And, um, and that sometimes like failing can still teach you a lot of stuff. Like uh, to be honest, when I had my first child, a lot of what made it possible to schlep her up and down the stairs with all of the gear and the stress and the anxiety of being a new mom in New York City, I was like, oh, these are skills I learned from climbing mountains and running marathons. Like, like, this feels familiar. Wow. Because I've done it in other contexts. When I did it, it did not feel familiar. But <laughs> subsequently, I've been like, oh, I can do that. I can because do that. I slept my daughter, like, and all the gear and everything right? in the car seat and then upstairs. Yeah. Th like, there was a moment going up and down Grand Army Plaza stairs where I had the baby on my front and a backpack on my back and a pumping bag on one side and her food bag on the other side. And it was February in New York City with snow and there's no elevator at that, at that, and it's rush hour. And I'm trying to get her to daycare. And I was like, I summited Kilimanjaro. Right? And I'm two months, three months postpartum. So like, I'm still not feeling great. And I, I like made it to daycare and back. I was like, and, it is, and I'm going to do it again tonight. It feels like, it's the, often those traps do actually feel like huge. Huge. Yeah. But, but I had, I was, I had something I could draw on because I was willing to do something that I wasn't perfect at the first time. And so I think that, that's what I try to, to emphasize with the idea of failure is that A, failure in itself was very rarely failure, right? In many cases, failure is my expectation and reality didn't quite line up. Uh, B minus in different geometry. Yeah. It's not failing. It felt like a failure because I'm an A student, especially in math. But in that case, the way you just said that, <laughs> I love you. In that case, it felt like a failure, but it wasn't. And giving up because it wasn't perfection would have been idiotic. Um, but in reality, it's just letting letting those moments of, well, I wanted this one thing, or I hoped for this one thing, and another thing showed up instead, but I still got something out of it, and it was still worth doing. And I don't know where I'm gonna be able to draw on this in the future. I bet I probably will, especially in the context of a portfolio life. You don't know which strands. I brought it all back. back. Oh, that was good. You don't know which strands you're gonna pull on. You don't know which communities, which networks and relationships and skills that you are gonna be able to draw on because the future is changing so fast and there are so many things that we never saw coming that all of a sudden happen. That you're like, wait, I have this skill from seventh grade musical theater class that's suddenly relevant. Like I literally had to cut my husband's hair in the middle of a pandemic. Guess where I learned how to do that, right? Like these are, these are, I guess my point is just because you don't see why it's worth doing doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Give it a shot. Try things you're not great at. Bank it for later. Sold. I'm I'm going to Everest. <laughs> I am not. I am not going to Everest. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Christina, or or you're just sitting and thinking about your next up? Oh, Cheyenne has a question. 
How are we doing this? Are we doing are we doing mics? No? We're just gonna yeah. Um so after Quincy kind of failed, was that really failed, not kind of. Like legit <laughs> failed. After it really, really failed. failed. Yeah. Um I mean after kind of a failure like that, how do you go back to working in an industry that was kind of really hurt you know, and it really made you like That's a great, great question. question. I'm going to turn yeah. it like, how do you, after a failure of such huge magnitude, how do you, how do you go back to an industry that hurt you yeah. and and also saw you fail? Yeah, I'm going to just add added that in. There was definitely a, like a period where I considered moving to Iowa. I know no one in Iowa. I'm from Michigan, but I there was like a well, I'm single. I'm living in New Jersey. Like no one, no one will notice if I leave. Right? Like it's fine. Um, and and uh, so I definitely considered it. Um, one of the reasons I didn't is that in the course of my 70 coffee chats, when I was asking everyone like, what am I good at and how do I, what do I do next? They kept emphasizing how strong my network was. I knew everybody in New York startups. And I realized that if I walked away to save face, I was literally leaving one of my best and strongest assets on the table. And that like I, did I want to succeed or did I want to save face? So there's a little bit of like humility involved of I'm going to show back up to the space that saw me fail. Um, and I can't really spin it any other way because everyone saw it. Um, but you could wear a Quincy dress and show up and it would look really good. And I still do. Um, so, so that was part of it. It was like, do I want to, do I want to save face or do I want to succeed? But there was also, I could, I could write the terms of, um, well, who do I want to still work with? So um, I don't have to go back. I have not raised a dollar of venture capital since that, that venture. I've had two other ventures since then. I've taken money from other types of investors. I have not gone back to VC. Someday I might, under different circumstances, but so far, I haven't really found the need to. Um, I also have not worked in fashion since I chose ed tech and media for my next two ventures. Um, and don't really see the need to ever work in fashion again, right? So, so the, I could go back in different terms and say, what are the, what is the context, or what are the, you know, the people that I do want to spend my time with, and um, and who are the ones I don't, um, and and kind of rebalance that. But certainly, going back to startups in general was, it was hard. Um, but I think that's part of the being open about failure. Like if I knew I, I couldn't hide it, spinning it was not really gonna do me any good. So why not just go for extreme transparency? And, and quite honestly, by being open, by letting my professor write the case on Quincy, I've done a ton of interviews about it since, like that's the reason I'm a professor now. It's, it's the only reason I'm a professor now, because I was able to sow this track record of going back and spending time in a classroom and getting to see how powerful it was to teach um, other students off of the experiences that I had that even opened that door. So if I hadn't been open about that failure, I wouldn't even get to do this job, which I love so much. I mean, it, it, I think after the pandemic particularly, there's a lot of people who ended up places they were not expecting and, and maybe open doors that they didn't remember that they had. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see another hand is raised. Alex. Christina, can you talk a little bit more about the narrative? Because we call it a lot of concepts around failure, it's a lot of shame and not wanting to talk about it. So it's both the internal piece but also externally. How do you go through that? Yeah. The question is about uh, just about the narrative, reframing it, uh, and what, yeah, uh, both internal and external. No, this Thank is you. interesting. So, so the research on the costs of failure um, basically breaks out into three categories. There's the financial costs of failure, which are usually pretty straightforward, right? Like, my company failed, I had zero dollars left, <laughs> and that sucked. Um, and and obviously, different people can weather the financial costs of failure differently. If you have a partner who is making money and you're on their health insurance plan, it's a very different world than if you're single and you don't. Um, 
Then there are the social costs of failure, which is a little bit of what the last question was about, which is how people perceive you after a failure and whether you are given a second chance. And, and not everyone is given the same second chance. Who, who tends to get uh, <laughs> a second chance and who tends not to get second chance? That's so interesting, Rachel. So the research tells us that um, white men, cisgendered, uh, heteronormative, the, the closer you are to that kind of expectation of certainly well-educated from a pedigree, whether that's a blue chip company or a, an Ivy League school, they tend to fail up. They, after failure, are not only given a second chance, they're given a second chance saying, well, I, I know you can do better than that. We're gonna give you, you know, a, a really great second chance. And the farther you are from that paradigm, the less likely you are given not just the second chance, but the benefit of the doubt that your potential is greater than that previous experience. So certainly the social costs of failure are not borne most equally across everyone. But the third category of, of costs of failure are the psychological costs. And this is where I think you have the most control, because this is where your form of identity comes out of, how do you construct that narrative of like, what does this failure mean about me? And um, the more people are closely aligned with their job as their identity, the harder it is to survive the psychological cost of failure. Everyone knows this in America, we love our jobs as who we are, we go to parties as how we produce ourselves. Not everyone does this around the world, but do we, we love really it do. or are we a well, it, to it? Well, right? it's both. And right? does our capitalism health care right? depend sure. on it? Right? <laughs> I do, I love snacks with you, though. But we see our professional identity as who we are. And when we lose that, it feels like we have been ripped apart. So two ways around this. One is I, you know, build an identity that is not just reliant on that one uh, professional identity. Um, this is where a portfolio comes into play, right? When Quincy failed, I went from being the founder and CEO of Quincy Apparel to I'm Christina. And I was like, I literally don't know what to say. I'm a former opera singer, erstwhile math nerd, once founder of a fashion company. Like, how, who am I? And I spent a lot of time in the years after that trying to pull one level up from, well, who I, am I? not dependent on any specific job. Um, so now I introduce myself and say, hi, I'm Christina, I'm a human Venn diagram. I built a career at the intersection of business technology and the arts. And usually that is followed up with, that's, that's interesting, I don't entirely know what that means, tell me more. And then we have a chance to talk about um, any particular job or any specific thing I've worked on. And my zigzag resume doesn't seem quite so eclectic when you have that framing but it's a level up from any specific job. And it took a long time to learn that. So, so in the psychological cost of failure, being able to separate yourself from your job and to be able to accept that you can fail, but that doesn't mean you are a failure, right? And, and you are allowed to do a thing that does not meet the expectation that you had set for it. That's just being human. But a lot of overachievers are not great at that. Um, and so this is, these are sort of the two twin skills of storytelling, of narrative, of that sort of self-identification uh, that can help you overcome the psychological cost of failure, which I, I find to be the hardest of the three. So I have a, a, like a follow-up from that, which is this, this, I'm getting from this conversation that this is a part of like years of work and introspection <laughs> and, and learning from yourself yeah. and listening to yourself, which is yeah. amazing. Can you, uh, what are some resources that helped along the way? Uh, yeah. Books, uh, speeches, therapists, like what people, amazing friends, like what, like what, what has, what were the things you drew on yeah. this? Because this is, you, like this does not sound like something you can do alone. Um, it's not, certainly the, those 70 coffee chats helped a lot. I needed the people around me. And, and I went to people not just who had seen me in my startup days, but I went to people who had known me across the whole spectrum of my career, from college, my life at Metropolitan Opera, pre-business school, post-business school, all the way through. 
um, because I needed them to reflect back at me who they saw, because I couldn't see myself anymore. I, I'd like, I felt lost. And so I needed that outside opinion to help me remember what, who I was and where I fit. And they were the first ones to tell me that the failure didn't matter. Like I did not believe them for a, a while, but I needed to hear it from them uh, to the point where I could finally start believing it for myself. So that was one piece, just like your tribe, the people around you, um, and you have to invest in that tribe before you meet them, right? So this is where like networking doesn't really help you. You have to have these real relationships that you can lean on. Um, two was a therapist, for sure. Definitely went to that therapist, anxiety, right? We were close. Um, and, uh, and, and that was just helpful to have a place that it was not someone I was dating or someone who maybe helped build that anxiety reservoir, i.e. family, <laughs> that I could just talk it through. Um, and, and again, and reflect it back. A lot of these things, when I finally heard them, were all things that I was like, oh, that's right. That is right, like I know this. But, but I needed that sort of external um, partner there. And then the third one was I just read a lot for sure. I, I literally searched for things on failure and I was like, well, I need someone to tell me that this is okay. Like any, any great um, recommendations? I mean, it's, it's, it's cliche, but it's classic, the growth mindset with Carol Dweck, like just being able to get out of the framework of who I am today is all I'm capable of. And instead saying, well, just because I can't do it today doesn't mean I can't do it ever. Um, and the data that I'm getting back of, I, I'm not getting there today, uh, is helpful if I want to keep trying. There's a, a great, um, I profile him in the book, uh, a timpanist at the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, Jason Haheim, whose first life was as a nanotechnologist at, at a tech company in Chicago and then uh, pivoted to be a professional percussionist instead. Um, and he, he journaled that entire process of switching from being a scientist to a musician um, through a process he calls deliberate practice where he literally used the skills of a scientist with his lab notebook to just keep track of what did I hope would happen and what actually happened and where's, where's the difference and how do I make up that gap? And he went on audition after audition after 26 auditions in a row and got cut. And on his 27th audition, he won the principal Tiffinist job at the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. He didn't go to conservatory. He never formally trained as a percussionist. He did all of this on the side as part of his portfolio while he was a day job nanotechnologist uh, at, at this company. Um, but he just documented, well-documented failure. He just chipped away at it until one day it worked. Um, and I think that kind of that growth mindset uh, is the big shift between I am a failure and this failed, but that doesn't mean I can't keep going. I know it was not intentional. I, I will tell you, I chose physical things because I was not an athlete. I literally cheated on the mile run in junior high gym class. Like the presidential physical fitness test where you have to run a mile. We didn't have a gym. We had to run four laps of our parking lot and I hid behind a tree for three laps and then I spritzed myself with a water bottle so I looked really sweaty. And then I came out on the fourth lap and I, I made sure to finish like next to last so no one would notice. Wait, did, 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 anyone, did anyone ever? Never got caught. Um, I, I was told, I was told by the adults in my life that I was not athletic. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm smart I and mean, I can do other things with my time. It's great. Um, and so when I specifically was like, I need to do something I'm bad at, it was so obvious I need to do something athletic because I am not an athlete. Um, so that was, it was not intentional of like, let's get out of my head and just do something physical. But, but that is exactly what I did discover that like that chance to just stop thinking for a hot second and and just do the thing um, was a huge relief, you know, like just the being able to balance um, 
the intellectual with the physical a little bit better over the course of my day. I mean, plus like the endorphins. Who knew? I did not know. The endorphins are great. Uh, and even though I was a slow runner, like I was definitely exercising for the first time in my whole life. Um, and, uh, and it had a lot of great like payoffs in other ways. So it's um, diversification. It's all about your portfolio. Have I mentioned that? You have. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, Christina, thank you so much. This has been very illuminating. Even for me, who I, well, I've been friends, if it's not obvious, I am friends with Christina, and I have <laughs> been friends with her since I met her, I think, at the launch of Quincy. Mm -hmm. uh, in some, I'm trying to remember, like, it was, it was Chelsea and Lindsey Green. Yes. And, uh, oh my God. And we went and we went to, like, lo like, like looking, yeah, looking at the rats and, like, <laughs> oh, which one should. Um, uh, and so saw the rise and and, well, and all the things. Um, but uh, I loved uh, I loved this. I love uh, going with you on this journey and uh, thinking about what what I might be bad at because <laughs> I too am just so good at everything. Um, no, I love I love these lessons and uh, and learned a lot today. And you're amazing. Thank you. And uh, thank, you for thank you for coming to Saxworks. <laughs> which is a wonderful company that I totally have not completed with my own identity, but I'm very happy to be part of. Um, I realized that at the beginning I forgot to tell people about Saxworks, so welcome to Saxworks. We are a new kind of membership club for work, for life, for wellness, and for inspo, uh, like Christina. Um, and uh, we hope you will come visit us even if you um, had to wait this long to hear about just just where she was and what the deal was uh, with the plants. Um, there's lots of plants here at Saxworks. Anyhow, we are so happy to have you, so lucky to have you, and I can't wait to read this book. Can you remind me, what is the title of this book? It's called The Portfolio Life. I can't wait for it. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have some French fries.